Maria uh, has been an amazing partner of ours almost from the very beginning of the campaign for wool here in Canada. Um, again, not only uh, does her and her family run um, one of the biggest uh, wool and mills in the country, um, but again, they, many of you as knitters uh, will be very familiar with their products. This is, they're one of the biggest suppliers of, uh, I think, or if not the biggest supplier of Canadian wool yarn. Um, we, we've been involved with them, as I say, from the very beginning, they provided wool when we were doing retail installations at Whole Renfrew and things like that. But again, as our plans shifted uh, and we started to focus more on opportunities for Canadian wool, they've also been able to supply for some really um, amazing products. So um, the, can the carpet initiative um, that we had a few years back with a design by Sarah Richardson, 100% Canadian wool carpets, that was all Briggs and Little Yarn. So again, um, they've been work, they've worked with us on many different projects uh, and we continue to have uh, new and exciting initiatives to work together on uh, to be able to demonstrate beyond, again, their, their wool makes great sweaters, um, but it can make uh, a lot of other things too. So we're, we're keen to demonstrate that. So without further ado, I'd like to put it over to Leah to talk about uh, her amazing family business, her life in wool, um, and uh, give us a little glimpse into uh, how all the magic happens. So over to you, Leah. Thank you, Matthew. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. And I wanted to thank you and Alyssa and Campaign for Wool um, for inviting us to do this. We're, uh, I'm honored to be part of this speaking series. And we also, as, uh, as a whole for Briggs, from Briggs and Little, we just wanted to say we send our condolences to the royal family. Um, so, but I'm excited to be here. And uh, I've got a little PowerPoint that kind of explains a little bit about the family history and it gives you a slideshow of the production. Um, so if I can share my screen, we can we can get right at that. Okay. You're good to share whenever. Okay. Okay, so as I said, this is just a, a little history about the Littles and uh, a virtual tour uh, for this speaker series. So I'm gonna go over the history. I'll explain, uh, or just do our mission statement. I've got a few fun facts and then we'll do the virtual tour. So the woolen mill was created in 1857. That's when the first woolen mill was built. And this photo is circa 1910. And the gentleman that you see in the white shirt with the black vest is actually Roy Little. And he would have been one of the, the first gentlemen uh, that ran the woolen mill. And notice this is the woolen mill that you're seeing, but as we go through the pictures, the woolen mill is going to change. So you notice in this photo, it's a, a different building. This is circa 1930 to 1940. So we have encountered four fires in the mill. And that's why you see multiple buildings that uh, the woolen mill has been in. The third photo is circa 1970, and this is actually the building that when I came into the family, this is what I got to see, and it was a remarkable building. All wooden structure, the oils and lanolin in the floors, um, the smells, it was, you know, it's just, uh, you know, a country bumpkin's wonderland. And this is our building today. So this was taken actually last year. And the building that's behind the two flags, that is our office area. The woolen mill itself is to the right, but it also goes out through to the back and we have a lower level in the back. So it's, it's grown and it is 100% concrete. We, if we have another fire, it's, it's not gonna burn to the ground this time. So these two gentlemen, the couple on the left is Howard and Lottie Little, 
And the gentleman on the right is Ward Little. And they are the first generation of the Littles that are in the woolen mill right now. So that would be my husband and two of our three sons. So as we go through the pictures, I'll just let you know, this next photo is Roy Little. And so he would have been second generation. This is Roy's son, John Little, and he would have been third. John Thompson isn't a direct relative of my husband. He's um, a cousin through, I believe, my mother-in-law's side, but he's he is related. And he was a partner with John Little for many, many years. And this is Mike Little. So Mike is the current owner of the Woolen Mill. He's also my husband. So he is fourth generation. And then our two sons, like I said, are fifth generations. So our mission statement, it's to create pure wool yarns that are dependable, economical, and meet or exceed our customers' needs and expectations. Because your time deserves quality. So here's a few fun facts. So as I had stated before, the first mill was built in 1857. We've survived four fires and two floods. We've held the name Briggs and Little since 1916, which is 106 years. One sheep produces approximately three to five pounds of raw wool. And on average, we use 250 wool fleece per day. So you can just imagine, some people will ask, well, do you have sheep at the woolen mill? No, because we would have to have so many of them to keep us running. It would be, you know, it would be a crazy amount. So a one day's production typically is 600 to 675 pounds of yarn. So that equates to 750 to 1,000 pounds of raw wool. The typical um, sheep's wool that we use is Supple and Dorset and Corydale. They are what work best in our machinery and our machinery is antiquated. Um, we have old machinery, there's, there's nothing new within the, the mill production. And we cannot use Scottish Blackface, Romanoff, or any crosses of these breeds because the wool from these sheep are actually, it's very hair-like and when it goes through our machines, it just falls out. So it doesn't, it doesn't produce anything that, uh, that we can use. So we purchased the majority of our wool from the Canadian Cooperative Wool Growers and they're in Carlton Place, Ontario. And then of course we have local farmers that bring their wool directly to us. And they've come, they come from all over the Maritimes, but most of them are quite local just because in order to get here, you know, you have to think about the cost of, you know, travel and, and whatnot. So most of them are, are within our, you know, Quebec and, and uh, New Brunswick. And in nine, in, sorry, in 2021, Briggs and Little produced 147,232 pounds of wool products over 226 days. So that's uh, that's a little few little tidbits about behind the scenes. So we'll get into the fun stuff. This is the virtual tour. So when we purchase our wool from the Canadian Cooperative Wool Growers, we purchase a transport trailer load, which consists of 40,000 pounds of wool. And you'll see in the middle photo that they are in 1,000 pound bales when, they're, when they arrive here. So on the forklift is actually two bales. So it, uh, it has 2,000 pounds sitting on it. And then the photo on the right hand side is actually a photo of one of our farmers that had dropped off some wool. So they, they brought it all bagged up for us and we take it and we weigh it all 
and make sure that it's you know long enough, the staples long enough that we can put it through our machinery okay, and not too long so it doesn't wind around the the doppers and whatnot. And then they go, they either leave with a, a, a check in their hand or they trade their wool for a yarn. Then they just come into our little retail store and we calculate what the wool would be worth and then they take it home in yarn and they make beautiful products with it. All right, so in the mill, the first thing that happens is the thousand pound bales are brought into the basement in the lower level and they're unleashed and it's amazing to kind of watch them pop open because they want they're all compressed so they pop open into these big bales and then they are loaded into our washer and the washer actually has three bins in it so it's washed twice and then the final bin is our rinse cycle. So that's it being washed. And then when it comes out the end, um, it's put into into these, I can't even think what they're called now, <laughs> into the carts. And uh, they're taken over and put into this unit, which is our raw wool dryer. So if the wool is, is just being dried natural, it will go through this machine and then it's actually blown upstairs into one of our wool rooms. If it's going to be dyed, then this circular kettle is where we put the wool and then it comes out beautiful colors. So this one is actually pink. So down in the lower level, we also dye all of our solid colors in skein form. So they start out with the natural wool. And then they're turned into a rainbow of colors. And each vat is, there's 50 pounds that we can put into each one of those. And that equates to 200 skeins. So once the skeins of yarn have been dyed, then they have to be dried. So this machine, they load it up and it's fed through. So it goes in wet on one side and it comes out dry on the other. So downstairs, I had mentioned that when the raw wool is dried, it goes through the dryer and then it's blown up in into the wool bin upstairs. So this is the picker room. And you can see here that there's just natural white wool. So that's been blown upstairs through the ductwork into this room. And we have multiple rooms in the picker room. Um, so if the wool is dyed different colors, if there's say blue and red, then they are blown into separate rooms and then they're bagged up and uh, for a later time. Or it could be that they're blown, the colors are blown into the room and they're used to create a recipe. So there's one of our wool bins, it's full. And this is a start of a recipe. So this combination is going to create our horizon blue. And once this recipe is laid out on the floor, then it's manually taken over to the picker machine and it's fed through. So this is where the wool is, it gets all combined in together and blended. So that's coming out the other side. And once it's blended, it is again, it's blown by through the ductwork and over into what we call the house. So it's just a holding bin that is over beside where our carding machine is. And this is our carter. So the wool is loaded into the hopper. So it's a, a beautiful blend of, of colors. 
And then as it goes through the curve, this is the very beginning of it. And it it goes through the doppers and the cylinders and it comes to the midsection where it's what we call the ladder. So at this point, it's actually laid out in the opposite direction that it was initially carted in. And it's going to go through the second half of the carter in the opposite direction. So it goes, it's kind of like going horizontal one way and vertical the other way. At the end of our carter is where the spools are. So as these spools fill up, um, we have two ladies that look after taking the spools off. And they take them over to our spinning frames. So this is Horizon Blue that's just come off the carding machine. And they put them up on the top of the spinning frames. They're, they take the yarn and they feed it down through to, you can see the orange bobbins at the bottom. And they spin onto those. So after the spinning frame, if it's going to be applied yarn, then it's sent to the twister. So this is a two ply, three, four. It, if it's single ply, then it actually gets to skip this one and uh, it goes onto our reeler. So at the reeler, this is where these actual skeins are measured out for yardage and there are these skeins of yarn are created. We call these reeler bunches. So you'll see here, there's actually 20 skeins across the machine. And once they have rotated the correct amount, then they're taken off and they're placed in a, a bundle, a reeler bunch and they're weighed out to be sure that the skeins are weighing properly. So if they're not, then they go into our second spin. If they're too light or too too heavy, um, we don't sell them as our, our good yarn. We sell them as seconds. So there, anytime if you're in the store um, and you take something out of our second spin, it's there could be absolutely nothing wrong with it. It could be just a light skein or a heavy stain or something there might be you know, a speck of color in it or something. So this is a pile of reeler bunches. So what they do is as they come off the machine, they're weighed, they put them into the cart, and then they're sent off to skeining and pressing. So at skeining and pressing, these ladies actually handle each and every skein of yarn that comes through our woolen mill. And what they are doing is the top series of photos, you'll see that they're literally twisting the skeins of yarn into a butterfly skein. And then in the bottom series, this is where they press 20 skeins of yarn into a five pound bundle. So they're pressed down and tied off. And if anyone has bought bulk from us, and uh, you've ordered 20 skeins or more, this would be how it, it comes. So once they have bundled up the yarn, they put it on a cart, and the next thing they do is they label each and every skein of yarn with a sticky tag that indicates the color and also the lot number. So if you ever buy multiple skeins of yarn, you want to make sure that the lot number is the same so that if you're you know, creating a, a larger garment or a large product that they're all the same color or all the same lot number. So if we go back to the carding machine, those large spools that went to the spinning frame, if they're going to be used to make country roving, then the spools are taken off of the carding machine and they're brought directly to this machine which is our roving machine and they take five strands and feed them into the smaller spools and that's what creates our country roving so that's the little 
the little roving machine. And our roving is packaged by hand. We've got a little, we've got bags for them and little sealer, and then they're boxed up. So these are the two gentlemen that uh, keep all of our machinery running. And without them, the mill would be lost. They, uh, they're, they're running quite often during the day, making sure that everything's, you know, running well and everything's oiled and tightened and whatnot. And when they're not doing actual maintenance, then they're usually found at one of the stations helping out if anyone, you know, gets backed up or needs a hand, then these gentlemen, they pitch in and, uh, and help out where, where it's needed. So in our shipping department, these gentlemen look after all of our orders. So it doesn't matter if it's a retail order or a wholesale order. These are the two that handpick all of your orders and they bag them up, they package them up, they get all the shipping ready and they send them out the door. So this is just an example. We've got some of our socks and some of our yarn. So they've bagged it up. So typically we try to send our yarn out. If it's a, a 50 pound, the burlap bag is used quite often. And if it's something smaller, then we use the brown craft paper. And this is one of our large orders. It, uh, we put them on skids and we wrap them up and send them off by transport. So this is our storage area. So we have one, one large room that's just storage of yarn. And in each of these bins, there is the, they're capable of holding up to 500 pounds of yarn in each one. So, as you see, the one on the left is fairly full, the one on the right, not so much. Um, we're starting to catch up, but the last two years with COVID and everyone home, we had a huge influx and people were ordering yarn left, right and center, which was absolutely wonderful, but it really depleted our stock. So we are trying very, very hard to, uh, to get our storage back up and so that we can you know, supply everyone with yarn. So this is what we call cold storage. So any yarn that is surplus in our, our other storage unit, um, we bag it up and then we put it in burlap and we label it and it's just outside our shipping department and it's ready to be sent out. So we also have a retail store on site and we try to carry everything that we make. Sometimes, you know, when stock is low, we, we run out of it in our store also. But we've got a variety of all of our yarns. We have a little seconds bin that you kind of see on the floor, the wicker basket. And we've got some novelty stuff. You know, we've got a little bit of swag. We've got some mugs and buttons and whatnot. And this is our office staff. So Crystal and Heather, if you ever call in and you're placing an order or you have questions or you're stuck on a pattern and you need some help, these two ladies are the brains of the office. They, uh, they basically run it for me. They're wonderful. Um, they answer the phones, they look after the retail store, and uh, without them, I, I would be lost. So without the, all the staff, we'd be lost. But, but these, uh, these are my two ladies that, uh, you know, they really, really help out with making sure that everything runs smoothly. So the picture on the right is myself and Crystal and Heather. And then the littles. So... I'm uh, I'm not a little by birth, but I'm a little by marriage. And the photo on the left is 
our eldest son on the left hand side is John. Then my husband Mike, myself, and our youngest son Carl. We also have a third son. Um, he's our middle son and he is in Fort McMurray. He's been out there for quite a few years and maybe someday he'll come and join us but right now he's uh, he's living life to the fullest. So all right, so that is the end of, of my little virtual tour. And uh, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm going to try to answer them. And if I can't, we can, uh, you know, we'll work with that because I'm sure there's someone here that can. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that. What a wonderful presentation! Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. And 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 what a beautiful family. I guess maybe it gives. I don't know the status, but perhaps there there is hope that others could become a little by marriage as well. So, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, so uh, so yeah. So let's maybe we just uh, stop sharing the presentation, and then we'll just so we can see everybody, and then we'll dive into. To questions. There we go. Alyssa, did you want to moderate? Yeah, so if you do have a question, you can either put your hand up or just throw it in the chat and we will be moderating it. And we do have a question from Susan. So Susan says, who is the Briggs side of Briggs and Little? So his name was Matthew Briggs. And I don't have a lot of history um, about him, but he, uh, he it, the business was bought by Matthew Briggs and Howard Little. And that was, I think, that was the 1916, which started the, uh, the generations of Little. But unfortunately, I, I don't have a lot of information on, on Matthew. Thank you. And the next question is from Margaret. She says, thank you, Leah. When you are blending a recipe, do you weigh out the colors that were shown in layers in order to achieve color consistency? Yes, we do. So our recipe consists of what the colors are, how much um, poundage of each color they need. And once that's all laid out, then it's sent into the picker and blended there. Thank you. And Amanda says, what is the time frame from receiving the wool to finished product generally? Um, depending on what it is, because if it's just um, a natural color, then it, it doesn't take as long, of course. If it's uh, a dyed color that the wool is dyed, then you have to incorporate time to dye that wool and then send it through the process. Um, if it's a solid dyed yarn, <laughs> then it, uh, it's another process because you have to create the yarn and then send it back down to the lower level to be dyed in skein form. And then it's dried and sent back up to go to skeining and pressing. So it, they all kind of take a different timeline, um, but you can definitely, if you started at the bottom floor with washing and came up to scanning and pressing, it's it's only a few days. Okay, great. Before it's ready to be shipped. <laughs> um, Karen wants to know, um, is there any plans to start the mill tours and annual fall sale again now that COVID is not so predominant? <laughs> we are trying. We really had hoped that we would be able to do our sale this this fall and our we just don't have enough stock yet. Um, so definitely the sale will will happen again. Um, what we're going to do though, we're not going to have it in November. We're going to have it, I believe, in July. So that gives, you know, better weather and people can travel a little easier during during July than than in November. As for tours, we're really not sure. Um, tours are hard because there's a lot of different things that kind of fall, have to fall in line. Um, we have to take into consideration what works safe, you know, the regulations and rules with them. And it doesn't necessarily interfere with the employees, but it does, you know, when people stop and talk to them, it, it kind of takes away. So there's a lot of things to consider. 
Um, so there may be in the future, but, but I'm not guaranteeing it. <laughs> Understandable. Um, Linda wants to know why were there so many fires? <laughs> so um, I've only been here for one of the fires and that was the last one in 1994. And the cause of that fire, it was because it was a wooden structure, um, the fire chief ruled it as um, all the the lanolin and the oils and whatnot had soaked into the wood and whatever sparked set that on fire and there was just no putting it out. It just, it literally went up in flames. And different structure now, we're happy. Won't happen. Yes, yes. <laughs> I see uh, dirty concrete walls behind you now that's uh, no, no chance of fire there. That's, that's no. right, <laughs> right. Uh, so we actually, we have quite a few questions. Hopefully we can get through them all. Christine, <laughs> um, Christine wants to know, I love your super punch, super for punch needle rug hooking. Have you ever thought of creating a yarn specifically for rug hooking? We can only create what our machinery will allow. So the yarns that we create um, are, it's all because of the gears and whatnot that our machinery has. So unfortunately, there's there's not a whole lot of um, variation that we can, you know, kind of work with. So what we have is kind of what we have. <laughs> um, Heather wants to know, um, I'm just going to skip over the comments for time's sake, but I'll save the chat so she can see all your com your <laughs> lovely comments. Um, so Heather said, do you spin for knitters or do you spin worsted for weavers? So we were a woolen mill, so you can use our yarn for knitting, but you can also use it for weaving. Um, we do have uh, a lot of customers that are weavers and they weave with it wonderfully. Um, it's I don't know personally. I'm I'm not a weaver, so I don't know, you know, any details about it. But I can just go by what some of uh, some of our customers have told us, and it weaves wonderfully. <laughs> um, just to follow up on that, Heather also asks. Also, do you sell bats after carded for felters? We don't sell bats. Um, we do have some loose carded wool. We sell a lot of natural. And in our retail store, we have little bags um, of the colored that we sell, but uh, we don't have any bags. I do see, um, I think we have, yeah, we have Romy from uh, Revolution Wool Company on the call. And so, and they, she sells no, nice. So yes, the people who want, want bats, uh, go to her. Yep. And maybe, and maybe there's probably other people on the call that sell bats as well, but that's just the one that, that jumped out at me. Um, Erica wants to know, this is wonderful, how often do you make new recipes? Uh, for ourselves, not very often. We, we kind of have our, our staple colors and we don't really go off of those very often, but we do have customers that we do custom colors for. So there are people out there, uh, Deanne Fitzpatrick has a lot of custom colors, um, Cast On Cast Off has custom colors. So if you, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to call into the office, Heather and Crystal could probably tell you where, you know, some of our custom colors are in more detail. Okay, um, similar question, how do you, how often do you bring out new colors and what inspires or drives the new colors? So we haven't, well, I've been, I've been working in the office since 2018 and we haven't created any new colors in that time frame. So it's not very often. Um, I think we're, if we're I had- I think that it know, might be of interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we do. We get we get questioned and requests for different colors a lot, but 
we just we've got quite a few colors now um so anyway there's a few that i'd like to get rid of and bring in some new ones but i'm i'm not the color queen <laughs> maybe maybe again a little later on but maybe we could work on a, a coronation purple together there you go yes <laughs> so see some knitters chatting they purchase co special colors made for select stores. Are these colors only available through select stores? They are. If they're custom colors, then they're only available through that store. We don't sell them ourselves. Okay. Um, so in previous discussions with um, the Campaign for Wool, one of the bottlenecks has been scouring and the management of wastewater. Um, your company has its own scouring ability. How do you handle the wastewater? So we actually have a lagoon and in our lagoon, it, all the wash water goes into that and then it's filtered out. Um, typically we work with environment. So we have rules and regulations that we have to go by and we test the water. We're on uh, the Northeast branch of the Macadavia River. So it runs right by our woolen mill and we actually use that water for our scouring. So we're kind of using nature and then putting back into nature. Um, so because we, we do work with environment, um, there's, there's nothing, you know, nasty going into, into the waterways. And actually I was, uh, I've been working with another company um, with the lagoon to help deplete any of the fats and oils and uh, it's it's been kind of a, a work in progress but uh, I think it's it's a wonderful uh, wonderful endeavor um, and hopefully you know things will will turn out well with them because we normally we pump out our lagoon once a year to get rid of all that sludge and oils and fats and and uh we're hoping that we can you know deplete that that uh that pumping <laughs> uh, exciting comment here um a question was asked about briggs and we do have someone from the briggs family santana she says i'm a part of the briggs family it is so amazing to be part of, of a legacy like this. Also love knitting with the B&L wool. So that's exciting. We do Wonderful. have. Wonderful. Do you want to say hi, Santana? <laughs> she's still on. I'm not sure she's. Hi. Yeah, I'm still here. This was so oh, cool. Oh, I see her. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> you, should, you should get in touch and swap uh, genealogy information so you can uh, f figure out the connection. <laughs> um what, do you ship overseas <laughs> we do but the cost of shipping is kind of crazy <laughs> but we we do we uh we actually have a, a customer in germany that we ship to um there we've shipped to australia before you know we've shipped to china there's there's been a lot of different places but you have to take into you know into consideration that shipping is is kind of crazy <laughs> mm -hmm. um laura lay asks are the yarns a blend of breeds you mentioned or is there a recipe for blending those as well no the the wool that comes in is a blend of of those three and all the wool that we get from from the Canadian Cooperative Wool Growers is graded there. So I don't know, you know, what percentage would be in in those bales. Do you know? Just just jumping in, do you have a sense of of, of the micron range of the wool that you usually work with? I do. I pulled it out because I thought someone's going to ask me. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, <you're welcome. laughs> so in my trusty little book here, we have uh, our wools are between 24 and 30 microns. Okay. Yeah. So, which is which is the bulk of Canadian wool. So that's uh yeah. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> um Glad you had that. 
Romy's asking if there's any way to get the lanolin from the water. I I'm sure there is. <laughs> In, you know, today's day and age, I'm sure there probably is, but we, uh, we, we don't, we don't separate anything. Um, the lanolin that's, and because we don't use any harsh chemicals to wash the wool, a lot of the lanolin is actually left in it. Um, and that can be kind of one of the reasons that people will say, oh, I'm allergic to wool. Well, you're not allergic to the wool, you're allergic to the lanolin. <laughs> um, so I, that's something with our wool because we don't use a lot of, of harsh chemicals um, or any harsh chemicals that the lanolin stays in it. So we don't have a whole lot that actually is, goes out with our wash water. Um, and then Karen says, this is a really great comment question. Um, are you able to share some of the community work that you do? I see you involved in many aspects of NB's communities. Thank you for all that you do to enrich the lives of people in NB. So we, um, since COVID hit, especially, um, before that, uh, we did a lot of community um, donations and, and whatnot, but uh, I've really tried to put a spin on our, like our advertising and any donations and helping out guilds and knitting groups. And um, we even had one young lady that was knitting Harry Potter hats and uh you know so we gave her yarn to in the the gold and rust colors and uh, so she could knit hats so um we really try that if anyone sends a request in um to support them um i i would rather you know give give a little to to the the smaller organizations and whatnot than you know spending money on advertising that nobody even actually looks at and reads. So so if you notice that we don't have a lot of, you know, magazine advertising or anything like that, that's the reasoning behind it. We're, we're really trying to support um, local. Great, and um, Karen also asked, since the buildings are now concrete, how do you manage the oils and lanolin? So there are, the machinery, because it's it's concrete floors, cement floors, um, anything that comes off the machinery and be it the, from the machinery itself or from the, the wool coming through, then that's cleaned up daily. So, you know, the employees, they keep their machines very clean. They keep the floors clean, everything's swept up. Um, every morning, you know, they come in and, and make sure that everything's neat and tidy. So. If anyone's done a tour of the mill, um, they can probably attest to to our mill is is fairly clean. Um, Barbara wants to know: Is all your fiber Canadian sourced? So the fiber that comes in, like I said, um, we do we do have a U.S. distributor, and that's Lacey Glidden. She's Maritime Family Fiber, and she actually has sheep. So she's in Maine, which is right on the border across from us. It's like, you know, 30 minutes, depending on which border we have quite a few, but anyway, we do take her wool, but it would be a minuscule percentage of the overall wool that we purchase. Um, so yes, the majority of our wool is definitely Canadian uh, with a very small portion that, that comes from the US. Great. And Barbara has her hand up. Barbara, would you like to ask a question? Oh, here we go. Just waiting for That's her to Barb you unmute. <laughs> oh, Barb, you got on. You're, you're muted, Barb. Here, hold on. Let's see. You're you're muted, Barbara. Barbara, if you just go in the bottom left corner, you'll see a thing that says mute. So just if you don't mind pressing on mute. <laughs> okay, you can also write it. Sorry. You can also write it in the was, chat. 
we'd be happy to. Okay. Um, and then Anne's asking, what about the dyes that you use? Could you say more about that? So the dyes that we use, um, we try to make sure that they're environmentally friendly. Um, they are commercial dyes. So we get them from a couple of different companies. But like I had said before, we where we work with environment, we can't have anything go through our uh, manufacturing facility that would harm anything. Um, so there's there's um, a lot of different dyes that color wise that we buy, and you could create a rainbow with with what we have in stock. Um, but like I said, there's there's nothing nothing harsh about them. Um, and we'll do one last question. Um, Margaret, what was your question? Hi, um, it wasn't a question, but it was an answer to a question. Um, someone had asked whether or not the Briggs and Little Wool is good for weaving or whether they create a yarn <laughs> for weaving. And I do use Briggs and Little Wool exclusively. I weave a lot of tartans and I use the one ply sport weight, it works beautifully and it doesn't bleed at all, which is really important when you're weaving tartans and all of those colors, you don't want the colors bleeding one into the next. So it, it works great. Okay, great Thank you, Margaret. Great ab, great to know. So from, from Margaret's loom to the Canadian Embassy in Copenhagen, uh, where one of our Briggs and Little Made wool, uh, wool yarn rugs is sitting, uh, you can find Briggs and Little Yarn everywhere doing amazing things. Uh, and I think this is, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to inflate your head too much, Leah, but I think uh, you, you're, you're definitely a superstar in the world of Canadian wool. Uh, obviously, this has been a very well attended group, a lot of really great questions. And I just want to thank you again for taking time out of your busy production schedule uh, to be able to uh, to let the people know what they want to know, obviously, which is all every detail of, uh, of of how you make the magic happen. Well, I greatly appreciate the opportunity, and I just want to say that uh, it's not me that makes the wool; it's <laughs> the 22 staff members that we have. And they are our heart, and we we appreciate everything they do. We appreciate their knowledge, and uh, just a huge shout out to all of our staff because they are wonderful. And a huge shout out to everyone that supports us um, in any way, shape, or form. We really appreciate it, and uh, we just want to thank you all. That was very very wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Alyssa. Uh, just just quickly before we go, uh, when is our next? Uh, event. Our said. next event is October 4th with Catherine from Small Bird Workshop. Excellent. Well, everyone stay tuned for that. Uh, Wool Month, uh, of course, starts October. We have, uh, I think we'll talk more at that event uh, of uh, all the different activities that will be taking place throughout October. But as expected, we've got projects on in fashion, interior design, and fine art. We'll be releasing the Fabric of Canada videos um th there'll be a lot going on all across the country so again i want to thank leah for her time and thank all of you for joining us for the spinning yarn speaker series uh remember feel better choose wool <laughs>